And a very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord, and thank you for joining us for One on One. Our special guest is the Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, the Honorable Kirk Humphrey. Minister, thank you for joining us. Good evening, Lisa. It's a pleasure to have you here in Q Blue. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you've been very busy since taking up this ministry. Let's start with the basics first, looking at the fishing industry. What mm -hmm. is the contribution of that industry to the local economy? I think if we're going to start with the basics, let's understand what blue economy is. Sure. And because there are a number of people who still don't fully appreciate what it is that we do. I like to remind people when this program started and it was offered the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy, there were many people saying, what is this? You know, what is blue economy? What is the minister going to be doing? I'm thankful that three years later, it has you know, been able to caught on. Um, so for, for us, the, the blue economy is about preserving and producing from the ocean space. I call it the three Ps. Producing, so you want to have production, you want to be able to generate revenue, new revenue, traditional sources of revenue, increase those. You also want to preserve because you have to do it in a sustainable way. So even if you're going to be involving ourselves in, in, in extracting from the ocean, it has to be sustainable. And then my third P, It's about people. So whether you preserve it, it's for people. Whether you produce, it's going to be for people. So it's about bringing together those three Ps. Uh, when we started the ministry as well, we determined that there were going to be some important pillars in the way we go forward. We figured health, um, health both in terms of the ocean, but in terms of the food that we eat, so protecting the health of the ocean. We looked also at marine transportation, which was a big part of what we do, shipping. Um, most of what we get in Barbados, 80% comes through the ocean. Um, we looked at that, and then of course we looked at fisheries as one of the traditional sectors, as a traditional anchor point of the blue economy. But there are also emerging sectors, like aquaculture. We also wanted to consider our marine spatial plan as part of our blue economy build out as well. So there were a number of areas that we determined were very, very important. When we set out to improve fisheries, it was within the context of understanding that this is what the blue economy is made of. And for me, the fishing sector has contributed so much to Barbados over the many years. But in my opinion, it had not been highlighted and or prioritized in the way that I felt it should be. So that is why we gave so much attention um, both to the markets, where the people actually work, and I feel people should work in decent conditions. But we also gave priority to the bigger idea of fishing and fisheries so that people could generate Um, significant more revenue than they currently do. The unfortunate reality Lisa, is that we currently import a significant amount of the fish we consume, which is regrettable almost for an island. Mm -hmm. um, we import, the figures vary, but between 60 to 80 percent of the fish, and it, differ, it, it differs based on the species of fish, right? But we import a significant amount of the fish that we consume. And obviously, we want to be in a position to change that. And that is why we're also looking at aquaculture as well as part of fisheries. We were just in con um, conversation with the FAO to be able to increase the production by about fish alone for tuna exports about two million. We only export about 500,000 US dollars a year in tuna. With the project that we are working with the U uh, FAO, we were hoping to increase that by two million dollars. Um, so the figure that I mentioned for you was uh, over a period, that's just a wild calculation, that was over many years, like 10, a decade. There has been no detailed breakdown um, of the contribution of fisheries, which is one of the things that we have to be able to, mm -hmm. to address um, in terms of the day-to-day -day contribution. And so for us, we set out to do a number of things. One, I knew we needed to fix the markets. So we started repairing the markets from On the east, we came around from Tent Bay all the way. And the last one we're looking at now currently is Spite Stone, but we also hope to be able to do Half Moon Fort in St. Lucie as well. And that is to allow people decent conditions, but it's also for us to meet phytosanitary standards set by the international agencies with which we associate. The other thing is that we're also working to repair the jetties. Mm -hmm. Now, we had not done any jetty work in over a decade. Um, and in some cases, more than that. So the jetty at Oystens, for example, was falling apart. And when I took over as minister, we had a conversation with the fishermen. They said, Minister, I want three things, the ones at Oystens. I want for you to deliver an ice machine, which we've delivered, it's been bought. We want you to be able to repair the jetty, which we are also doing. And they asked for a slipway at Oystens, which we brought in persons to look at. And we had a solution, we thought. But then we found the wave energy was for the solution we'd proposed and the engineering that we'd brought in. It didn't work.
So we asked them to give us a little time, and we're working now to do one in Bridgetown, temporarily, but we will do one at Oystens. We also did all the jetties in Bridgetown. And again, this is, this is not only about aesthetics, you know. People have to be able to protect their investment. The jetty, a bad jetty destroys their boats. So it's about protecting the jetties, first and foremost, I'm sorry, protecting their boats by having uh, proper jetties. It's about being able to offload fish quicker, be able to have those trans transactions moving faster so people could generate more revenue. But ideally, it is about finding new fishing methodologies so that you can catch, in some cases, the same amount of fish, but generate more money from that fish. If you loin the fish, for example, the studies show that if you loin fish, you can get more, more money for it. We were working with FAO to do a fish loining facility in Barbados. It's also about how you catch the fish. In the international movement now, it's called bait to plate. People want to know where the fish is caught and that it's being handled in a proper phytosanitary way from the time it's caught to the time it goes on a plate. And we can trace all of that. So there, there's a wider conversation being had about the contribution to the overall economy. Um, I suspect if we are able to do what we set out to do, both with the traditional fishing and now with the work we're doing in aquaculture to generate um, but growing fish, like growing fish on land, you mm -hmm. know how aquaculture mm -hmm. works. So once we're able to do that, we could see a significant improvement as well in the GDP. Let me stick on the upgrades for just a minute. In terms, if you could take me through the actual upgrades that were done at the various markets across the island. So at Tent Bay, we were able, Tent Bay is one of the smaller markets. Tent Bay was falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, so at Tent Bay so far, we've changed the, we painted the entire building. We changed the windows, we cleansed the floor. We were able to refurbish. We didn't change the counters, but I think we will have to. We refurbished the counters at Tent Bay. We, we did work on the bathrooms, facility, and the cupboards at Tent Bay. At Oisins, we did a significant upgrade. Um, Oisins and, Br and Bridgetown being our two more popular mm -hmm. markets. Um, so at Oisins, we changed all the countertops. We moved from having tiles with big spaces and grout, and those areas were natural breed, uh, breeding ground for, for bacteria. bacteria. Mm -hmm. And we, we changed all those countertops and we replaced them with a non-porous commercial quartz, um, which is not only beautiful and expensive, but it works. And we were considering using an, an, a kind of aluminum material there, but because of the proximity to the ocean. Um, we did all the cupboards as well. We upgraded the, the ice machine, as I said. Um, we've put on the roof renewable energy panels, so you'll see photovoltaic stations at the market also. We did the floor. We did an upgrade of the floor. We're working now to do the drainage so that the current drainage would back up. We're working now to clear the drainage to make sure that the... So it's all about being healthy and sanitary as well. So we've been doing all that work. At Bridgetown, we did something very similar. We changed the countertops, we changed the cupboard. Um, we were able to do the floor as well at Bridgetown. We renovated the, the ice machines there. Um, so a number, we did a number of things at all the markets. We did something very similar at Spice Town. Um, it is my intention now to do Weston. Weston is going to be done very shortly. The RFP, the request for proposals, should be out for Weston, hopefully by the end of the month, inviting people to bid to do the work at Weston. Weston is going to probably be a full upgrade like the way we had to do at Pile Bay. The challenge of Weston is that as the tides come in, the market is flooded. Mm -hmm. So it's going to require some serious engineering work to be able to rectify that problem. That's not one where we could just address the countertops and so on. So we're going to do a full upgrade. I also feel people should not only have understand fishing as an exercise. I think fishing now has to be an experience. And I've been drilling it in my staff. When people come to Barbados or when a Barbadian goes to the market, they should be able to sit next to the market and get something to eat that is prepared from the cash at the market. So we also have, that's why we're working at Pile Bay to have the nice sitting areas. We're going to be building some kiosks at Pile Bay to allow people to fry fish there. Maybe do some fish soup. I don't know if you like fish soup, but maybe do some fish soup. And just have a, a holistic experience. And that, that is my intention. So that when we start to think about the contribution um, to the from the industry, then you're measuring a completely different set of variables and looking at also different statistics. But it gives a completely different feel to fishing and to the fish experience. I also think it's important for me to say too that during COVID, we had prioritized the markets and we prioritized fisheries. So when a number of people couldn't work, we allowed the fishermen to work. We allowed the fish markets to open for the first uh, shutdown. 
we allowed all of that to happen. And the reason is because we felt fisheries were so important. We treated the fishermen as a, as a separate group, the fishing industry, I should say, as a separate group. And we gave them their vaccinations early because we felt that they should be able to go and to make a living um, and so on. So we've prioritized the fishing industry. And it's not only because of the contribution they make in terms of GDP. I think that, that to, to look at it that way would be narrow. It is the contribution they've made to us as a country, period, you know, in terms of our own folklore. This, you know, the fishing has its own culture. Um, and in terms of being able to, for us to have memories that go back a long time. So I felt like it was important to capture this component of Barbados. And I, I think we've been doing that. But people deserve to feel like they're valued. And for a long time, the fishing industry and the persons in it were not treated as if they were people of value. And we've been focusing on them because that's how we, we, we see them. And, and the reality is, I think COVID has laid bare the idea that we can depend on outsiders to feed us. It's laid bare the idea that persons that sometimes we've taken for granted are not integral to who we are and to our society. And, and so I hope going forward, people would understand, you know, people say, why, why spend so much money on markets? There's some questions that are asked sometimes that are so intrinsically arrogant and disparaging when it comes to people in the industry that I feel that we have a responsibility to dispel. And, and that's what we've been trying to do. And as such, you're looking at introducing technology to help the fishermen with their catches as well. Yeah, so we've done uh, a number of things. So there are these things called fads and they're fish aggregating devices. Now, a fish aggregating device is simply a, like a piece of anything, really, that could be floating in the sea and the fish, because they're drawn to things mm -hmm. that float, would aggregate around this device. Of course, in this circumstance where we built something, a purpose-built fish aggregating device, we have to have commercial chains that you know, allow it to, to be rooted where it is. Um, and we've included on the fish aggregating devices some buoys that are intelligent buoys. So we can see who's doing the fishing, it tells us the temperature of the water. It allows us to see the kind of fish that are attracted to, to this particular area in this device. It's never been done. Um, so we've brought in that technology to be able to, to work out when we plant the buoys. We're going to be planting in the first instance around Barbados. We hope to plant 20, um, again, through consultation. And what this does is that this allows fishermen to leave home knowing where the fish are, right? Where to go instead of having to go chasing fish. They can go to a place where the fish will aggregate and be able to catch fish uh, at those various points. So that is going to be significant. It means that they use less diesel um, in those instances. It means that we also know where it's being caught so we can make sure that we do it in a much more sustainable way because you don't want people to take everything. So we have to be able to manage that process effectively. It also allows us to register any kind of IUU, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You would have heard of people coming into waters, Caribbean waters, other waters, you know, casting their very long nets and taking everything. And we've been working assiduously with our international par partners. We've been working with the CRFM, the Regional Fisheries Mechanism, to be able to come up with a Caribbean pos pos position in relation to banning this kind of... These people who basically are imposters in your waters, and they're smart, right? They, they, learn, they know how to turn off their transponders. They know how to stay just outside and cast net. We've been working with the Coast Guard. In, in cases where we've found persons, we've called Coast Guard to go looking. But I think in, in, in cases with the intelligent technology, this would also help us to be able to, to, be able to, manage, to manage that. But the Caribbean has to work much more in unison, I think, when it comes to addressing IEU fishing. But overall, um, the technology that we've brought in there, I think, is going to be major transformation. We also feel that it's important that we use much more renewable energy on board the vessels. Um, we just built a vessel is almost completed now. It's the first of a lease to own arrangement that we're starting. So fishing, a lot of the fishing vessels are older. And we'd like, in my time at least, I'd like to be able to say that we modernize the fishing industry, right? So a lot of the vessels are older and fishermen unfortunately oftentimes struggle to get loans to be able to buy vessels. It's easier to go get a loan for a car. And even though the car will generate no revenue for you and the fishing vessel will but they're not seen as assets. And so many people have been keeping their boats for many, many years beyond their probable better lifespan and just keeping them because they can't um, access loans. And so we're, we're arranging a lease to own arrangement. So this is our first vessel. I'm hoping to do two more very soon. 
where fishermen will be able to get the boat from us and pay us back over time for the vessel. So the government provides the kind of financing arrangement. And if you're able to do that over time, gradually we'd see a modernizing of the entire fishing fleet. But we've also, we, we didn't just want to build boats. We wanted to, to have renewable energy on board the vessels. So not only to power through solar, to power the technology, the radio transmitter and so on, the television that they may have, but to power the engine. So we're working with BIDC now, with Mark Hill as well, to be able to come up with some innovation to allow us to power the engine, whether as a hybrid or fully electric. It's what we're looking to complete now, but that is going to be for the industry transformational. Um, and I, I look forward to, be, to being part of that, and then we actually continue to roll it out. So those are just some of the things we're doing in fisheries. Um, I think the other thing important in fisheries is just being able to catch the data. I began by telling you that we do not have the level of data mm -hmm. that I would like to, to see. Um, in many ways, a lot of the, the progress in not only in Barbados, but in the Caribbean and many times in countries, a lot of the progress that the country has experienced seems somehow to have bypassed mm -hmm. the fishing industry. So being able to digitize and digitalize the, 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 the industry, you know, the fisheries department, to have the records, record cash as soon as they come in and, and, and just proper data collection. Um, we're working on being able to do that as well. So when we have this conversation again in two years, if I'm lucky enough to still be Minister of Maritime um, Blue Economy, then I could speak more about those things. Let's look now at sargassum seaweed. Mm -hmm. It continues to be a headache. You've spent thousands trying to clear the beaches and you're also trying to mm -hmm. find other ways to use it. Where are you with that? You know, I, I, since the ash, I compare sargassum to ash, you know. People, I think people would get it if they compare it to the ash. Like the ash came two days and then we spent a long time clearing it. Sargasm is like ash coming, you know, Constantly. you clear it mm -hmm. and then it's, but unfortunately, you know, in the case of the ash, it, was, it came and it left and that was it. So for these seven months or so, six, seven months, it's constant, but three very, very heavy months. I believe our calculation said that about 50,000 tons of sargasm comes during the season. That's about just over 7,000 tons a week, um, about 1,000 tons a day comes on shore. Obviously, there's more in the water. Mm -hmm. Some may get caught up other places. It's a lot of sargasm seaweed. Uh, we had an instance where we completely cleared Consett. We did a lovely video. We shared it. Um, people went to Consett the day after and like, you didn't clear Consett because they saw so much seaweed. But we had that night a mat that just came in about the size of a football field and it took up the whole thing. Sargasm cleaning is going to be a consistent, constant effort for the, for the time that seaweed is here. Um, so we currently have, and we need to expand it, we currently have about 40 people who work um, in the season, moving the seaweed off the beaches. They were trained. So sometimes people also send videos of the guys. Sometimes what you have to do with seaweed is just cut channels mm -hmm. to allow the water to come in and take out the seaweed. Um, so it may look like you're cutting and putting the seaweed back in the ocean. What you're doing is actually creating channels. And, and that helps in some cases. In many cases, persons have been using the seaweed for productive use. But there's just so much seaweed. When we are using all the, the machines and all of the labor, at the time when I use NCC workers, who are now very busy keeping Barbados clean, and Barbados is a lot cleaner. When we were using the soldiers, who are now busy on the road as well, working with the police, and machines, we, used, we took about 125 tons of seaweed in a day. Um, some of that seaweed we took, a lot of it is being used by NCC, so they may spread out. We were using some at BAMC as well. But NCC would spread it out and then use it as it dries in their fields and, and various places, some at the botanical gardens. There are persons who have been using it to make a fertilizer um, in Barbados. Some have been using it for beauty products. But the reality is, Lisa, it is just so much seaweed. So what we're working on now with um, BIDC again is a project to create green hydrogen. And I really hope that this, this project is successful because what you do is that you allow the seaweed to dry. So you, have, you can actually use in this process all the seaweed. Once the seaweed is dry, then you can extract from it the hydrogen and use that hydrogen now as green energy to fuel anything. Electricity, you can use it to fuel boats and so on. And the port is also working on a green hydrogen project to allow us to use some of that same green hydrogen. So when ships come to Barbados, I'll talk about this later, but when ships come to Barbados, they turn off the engines and they come in on our own clean energy, keeping our waters clean. 
if we are able to, to get this done, and I believe we will because we've been working very closely with two different companies who, who are looking at green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is the way of the future. It is very expensive at the moment, as all new technology is, but it is the way of the future. And that's why the port is building out that way. And that is why, and hopefully in another month, I can speak to the public on where we are with that. Sargasm, for the most part, commercially, many people find it difficult to invest in it for a number of reasons. Sargasm is seasonal. So you would get sargasm five, six months, seven maximum in a year, heavily. Even in season, this is the second reason, even in a season, sargasm is not guaranteed. So one year you could have a lot of sargasm seaweed. Another year might be moderate or medium like this year is so far, though the projections are extremely high. And then you may get a year that is in abundance. So for I can understand for a commercial investor, you know, it is, it is difficult. Sargasm also, as the, of all the algae that were tested, and uh, seaweeds that were tested for energy sources, sargasm proved to be the least, um, and, and the content of arsenic higher. So it's a difficult material to work with, but the truth is that it is here, and we have to be able to work with it. And we have a sargasm harvester, which we brought in. We, along with the sargasm harvester, we have uh, a conveyor belt. So we catch the sargasm fresh and convey onto the shore or onto a jetty. And, and the, that works in circumstances where the sargasm is not too heavy. When sargasm is very heavy, there are very few vessels that can deal with it. And also because of the fact that Barbados is really in the Atlantic Ocean, the tides and so on um, sometimes can impede the, the function of the vessel. But we were able to use it successfully a few times on the roughest waters in Concept Bay. Um, I feel I could send you some footage. I would love to actually take you and let you see the sargasm harvester in use. We also brought in a tractor, which we retrofitted. One of the things we learned early, and the UNDP actually picked it up. One of the things we learned early is if we took the sugar cane equipment, the trucks that they use to transport sugar, and if we took the, the crane that they use to grab, it's like a grabber, mm -hmm. you know, and we retrofitted it, we could then use that to move sargasm off the beaches. So we retrofitted this tractor that we brought in. We're using it now to clear Skeets Bay. It's at Skeets Bay as we speak. And it allows us to make a lot of progress with the, the sargasm. But of course, the maintenance on these things then becomes the issue because salt water is not easy, you know? And that's why you find a lot of these things working on the sea. A lot of the private set of persons, if they offer to help us, do it one time, mm -hmm. you know? They don't want to come back because it's, it affects their machinery or they do it at a, a premium. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is why I keep insisting that we maintain our products, you know, we, main, we wash down the, the machines that we use, we oil them down, we keep them working. Um, so I believe over time we will have a proper response to the seaweed, but I keep cautioning Barbadians in sargasm season, there will be sargasm on the beach. Um, you will also find in cases where you see people working all the time on the beaches because it's going to be a day, daily process. Think about the ash. You know, ash coming every day, you have to keep doing it every day. So while sargasm is in the season, there's going to be sargasm. And sargasm becomes anaerobic quickly, like, you know, deprived of oxygen, mm -hmm. starts to smell very quickly. So, you know, we could clear a beach today. Two days later, you go, you see brown sargasm on the beach. It is simply that the process has started, especially if the sun is hot. Um, but I, I suspect that there is going to be a solution. We've met with a lot of the persons who are using the CV to be able to expand their business. I would like to think that, you know, the Barbadian private sector becomes a lot more risk takers and, you know, take bigger chances with a government that is willing to support them and give them the opportunity to fail forward. Um, and I, I, we've been doing that in the ministry. I've been talking to them and saying, look, you know, how can we help you expand so that we can use more of the seaweed? And then once the revenue is generated, remember this then becomes blue economy revenue. So that would also lend to the GDP for the, for the industry. Let's switch now to the Bridgetown port. Mm -hmm. which remained open during the height of the COVID-19 yes. pandemic. I don't think people appreciate what happens at the Bridgetown Port on a daily basis. If we could just go back to the operations of the Bridgetown Port during that time and now. Yeah, well, first I would like to thank the staff. Um, during the height of COVID, when many people were not working um, or were afraid to work, the staff in the Bridgetown Port continued to work. Mm -hmm. And they didn't just continue to work with Barbadians. They were receiving cargo from all over the world, and they were moving people. Um, at a time when people were very circumspect about 
the realities of COVID. So I want to begin first by thanking the management, the chairman, the former chairman who's now minister and the current chairman, and the staff and the management. They did a wonderful job um, during COVID. And we had implemented before COVID, we were looking at, I chair a subcommittee of the social partnership on port efficiency, which we were looking at how do we improve the functioning of the Bridgetown port in such a way as to lend value to Barbados. That meant, for example, Barbados is currently ranked 129 out of 170 countries on the Doing Business Index. In trade across borders, which is looking at ports and how you do business, Barbados is 132 out of those 170 countries. So we are worse off. And 129 is horrible, but 132 is even more horrible. And so we set out to say, how do we improve the trade across borders? How do we improve the efficiency in the port? It was taking a container, for example, 11 days on average to be cleared out of the Bridgetown port, 11 days. We're currently down now to five. I want to move to three days. Um, and the reason for that is because we've been able to improve the technology that we use in the port. Um, we've brought together the different agencies the, called other government agencies. So health, plant health, health, um, customs, the port, all the agencies that have to work. Before they would work at different times and now you can clear online and you can do it in unison so that if there's a problem it pops up before you get there. That allowed us to be able to rectify that. We didn't have this conversation in isolation. We brought in most of the importers. When we were having a conversation, we brought in the agents, the customs brokers, truckers. Like we really went down to the nitty gritty. Like I got a real worm's eye view of the entire thing. And we were able to rectify a number of challenges. So the port, even before COVID came, had actually gotten a lot better at doing cargo. Thankfully, I think, we got there before COVID came because it meant that we had put in place a system that allowed us to work remotely in many cases to be able to, to clear cargo and so on. We got good at it. But of course, during COVID, a lot of things changed. Businesses were closed. So even though we could clear faster, businesses were closed. Mm -hmm. So content and we were only moving. At first, we were moving um, only essential. very mm -hmm. essential cargo, like very essential yeah. cargo medicines and then eventually you know more food stuff and wider food stuff and so then we, we were importing a significantly less number of containers were coming and then we were moving them out of the port slower because of the fact that we had restrictions and so during covid we had a little backup which is expected anywhere in the world and it's one of the reasons that ship shipping prices have gone mm -hmm. up too because all over the world people were experiencing these delays and so we were able then to use the system that we put in place to move cargo a lot more quickly. And I am very happy with that. And even since the, the car, since COVID has, for the, the height of it, the fear of it, but it's still very much here, I just want to be clear. Um, we're, we've gone back now to six, seven days, um, heading back to our five days to be able to get cargo out of the Bridgetown port. The Bridgetown port took a hit though. We lost about, 20 million dollars in revenue annually you know it's it's a significant amount of the port's revenue was hit there there were less um cargo vessels coming so we were moving less cargo there were no cruise vessels coming at all so we had no cruise so our revenue took a significant hit um during that period but the the fact is that during that period we weren't sleeping we were continuing to build out a system to be able to become much more effective we've been using much more technology if you allow me to explain we currently have what is called FAL and it's not an acronym but it's the facilitation convention FAL is set by the international maritime organization it is a system whereby ships for example come in to, to call at a port normally have to fill out the same forms for everybody, for customs, for port, for health, for plant health. So they repeat these, these calls and they have to do it in every destination. It's laborious, mm -hmm. it's inefficient, and it's time consuming. And at the end of the day, all these things are costly. FAL allows us to have one main entry point through a maritime single window. People enter the information one time then it is disseminated to the various agencies. It's a lot more efficient. And the thing about that is that you don't have to wait for the ship to, to come here. So you see a ship would come and everybody would board it. And everybody's doing their own thing. No, no. They submit the information before they get here. It is processed before they get here. 
and this allows us to move a lot faster. The legislation is drafted, it's with CPC, it's finished. I hope to have it debated in Parliament but in July um, to allow us to put it fully into legislation, but we've already been testing the single window. But it is something that all countries, not just Barbados, all countries must do it. And it puts Barbados ahead because the other Caribbean islands aren't there yet, but they're working on becoming there. Then you enter it into one destination. You don't have to enter it everywhere you go. It makes it a lot faster. For me, that is important, not only because of all the things I said about cost and efficiency, but in terms of pollution. The less time a ship spends in port, the less pollution you have. And because it's, you know, the engines are off, they're not there, you know, until we get to the point where we're giving them more green hydrogen, which I hope is soon. So they're in and they're out a lot faster. It's gonna become a lot more efficient. But the whole processing of, of cargo through the Bridgetown port, um, it's taking a lot less time. We also wanna become a hub for cargo. So we want people to start using the Bridgetown port in the Caribbean as the place where you come and you bring your cargo. Mm -hmm. And then use it to, so, that, so that the cargo isn't coming necessarily to Barbados, but it's coming through Barbados and generate more revenue. And if we're able to become a lot more efficient and faster at doing business because people want to go where they can be processed quickly we get the faster we get the more business we get the more business we get the more people we employ the, the likelihood of bringing down prices and so on so all these things are, are very much integrated um, but the British Downport really in my mind is one of the most efficient organizations in the entire government and they're very good at what they do the port has won numerous awards over time not just through this government or you know, whether it's this iteration of the government or previous iteration, all the time. The port consistently wins um, several awards. So I suspect that we are on our way to doing a number of great things. What's happening with the $1 billion master plan for the port? So the $1 billion master plan was started before COVID. And there's still a master plan, but obviously we have to go in and tweak on some of those projects. But I will mention a few of the projects. And I think it's important for people to understand that there is a plan. This is not an ad hoc situation whereby we are just doing things. Um, but there are, there are a number of things of which I am proud and I hope that we're able to pull them off soon enough. But we have to separate cruise and cargo. In Barbados now, you could get off a cruise ship and literally be dealing with potatoes if there is cargo being dealt with at the same time. Uh, it is necessary to separate cruise and cargo. We want to build a cruise facility and we'd had different proposals. Currently, we are now at a point where we're working with the cruise lines again to talk about how do we build out uh, this new cruise facility. And this would allow us to then have only cargo coming at this where we are and crews coming at a new facility we're identifying closer travelers away. Mm -hmm. All the drawings have been done. We've done all of the modeling um, in relation to, you know, the different size of the pairs and where the ships would line up. People want to call at a safe harbor, at a safe port. The cruise lines would tell you that right here, uh, although people don't think it is as cute maybe as some other places, right here, they've never missed a call. Barbados has always been safe. So coming to Barbados, they know that once they're here, they're going to be good because of the fact that the waves and, and so on, if the waves are terrible or if the ocean is playing up, they may not be able to. And that's the risk of a new cruise facility. That's why we have to do modeling to make sure that we've done it right, to look at the wave, the wave energy, so that the cruise ships, if they do come, they don't miss a call. And you don't want that. You don't want that kind of reputation. So that work is very advanced. We have drawings. We're tweaking the drawings. We've gone back to look at new modeling because we've you know, we we've reduced, in a post-COVID environment, a billion dollars is easier said than actually done, right? So we've reduced uh, the plans, but we're modeling those. We're also looking at a central examination facility in the Bridgetown port um, as part of our whole logistics, cargo logistics build out. And I think that's important. That is a facility where you go and you inspect all cargo and we have to build it out. Um, so it'll be a joint inspection team, again, increasing the efficiency in the port. And it would reduce the need to take goods off site, which would improve security because everything is tested in this particular facility. You check there, we know what's in your container. We're also looking at building out the Shallow Draft Marina. And the Shallow Draft Marina is an important part of the project because for the Shallow Draft, there is currently a number of vessels there, a number of local vessels, some international vessels, but mostly local vessels who, call, who are birthed at the Shallow Draft. We want to make that bigger and allow more vessels to birth. 
And we also want to build out a massive hollow facility. Now, Barbados does not have currently a proper hollow facility. What that means is that cruise vessels, like yachts, not like mega cruise vessels, or yachts and so on, would bypass Barbados because we can't haul them out. You can't get the repairs done here. They can't be cleaned here. So we're building a proper haul-out facility as part of our build-out as well, which will attract significant business to Barbados and give us a modern port. So those are some of the things that we have to be able to do as part of our billion-dollar plan. But it certainly is what we have to be able to do to make cruise modern, you know, to have a modern cruise experience. Our current legislation, Lisa, does not separate domestic shipping from international shipping. So that you're dealing with jet skis on the same legislation that you're dealing with cruise ships. You understand? So it's, it is like we hadn't paid enough attention. We've now separated domestic and international merchant shipping. Um, that legislation will also be debated very soon. But we've worked with the jet ski operators. I don't know if you've been, but you will see on the beaches, we've identified lanes mm -hmm. like buoys. Yes. Those are going to be entry and exit lanes for, for persons who are, are doing watercraft, jet skis, and other vessels, and so on. We've done those. We're working now to finish off the beaches, but they're identified at every beach where the jet skis operate and the watercraft. And they'll be the entrance and exit points. Um, we're going to put signage there to keep Barbadians out of the lanes because we don't want anybody to get hurt. But again, you can see jet skis just coming close to where people are. We're managing that process. But we're also managing the international process as well. So it's a whole process of management, both in terms of our build-out and in terms of the logistics planning and in terms of how do we treat to these larger cruise vessels. You mentioned security briefly, and that's a major talking point amongst mm -hmm. Barbadians. Too many illicit items are still passing through the Bridgetown port. Well, I don't know that they're passing through the Bridgetown port. I, I couldn't possibly say that for sure. I know that they're coming to Barbados. Of that, I am absolutely certain because they're here. How they get here, if we knew for sure where they were coming, we would address it. It's certainly been one of the most concerning issues for the government, certainly. So in the port, for example, when I came in, there were only 22 cameras working. We now have 88 views around the port in phase one. We intend to have another 80 views or so in phase two so that we could see everything that goes on in the port. We get a report almost daily on which cameras are up and which cameras are not up. We're really taking security seriously. We installed a $20 million scanner so that everything leaving the Bridgetown port, every container, whether it is a container going to another facility or not, is scanned before it leaves the Bridgetown port. That scanner allows us to see what other scanners could not allow us to see. So anything that we see that is suspect will be stopped before it leaves the port. We also installed two other scanners. There's a scanner now in Shed 2 and a scanner in Shed 4, which will scan the less than container loads, the smaller, you know, the same barrels and so on. And we make sure that we scan those containers as well. The scanner in Shed 2 recently wasn't down. We've been on it. Get the scanner back up. So we've been scanning the goods. We've been looking at the cameras. You know, we've been working with our security officers to give them the extra training that they need. We've been very, very, this government is extremely serious about security. And that's the one area that I know that we cannot afford to slip on. That things illicit are still coming into the country is regrettable. But we have to figure out how they're coming. And once we figure out how they're coming, we, we intend to address it. We're having a conversation now with the union about um, TVTs, it's like detector tests, um, to make sure that, yeah, all, I think all security agency, agencies should be doing them to make sure that, you know, we are working with the staff to make sure that anything coming in, you know, the staff is up front. And I don't think the staff have anything to hide. I have said before, I'm very proud of the staff in the Bridgetown Port. Um, and all of us should subject ourselves to it on occasion, if necessary, um, to make sure, to give the public also that sense of comfort. And not just the port. I think it should happen across the board um, for persons who are involved in security, as it does every other place in the world. And that's a conversation we have to have, of course, with the union and with the staff and so on. But to make sure, even if it is for the newer staff coming in, just to put it in place to give Barbadians that greater sense of comfort and confidence that the government is working on their behalf. And it also clears the port because, as, as we were discussing earlier, the idea that barrels were coming into Barbados and that people were troubling or tampering with barrels in the Bridgetown port. And even though I've addressed it on, on several occasions, this, this, this notion that somehow the port was allowing people to, to, to 
Tampa Bowles is simply not true. So that I can tell you, we can go back on camera for about six months. We went, we took a, uh, a few bars and we went back about four months. From the time the bars came in, where they're positioned, you can see who went to the barrel. At the time of inspection of a barrel, you can see when the barrel is being inspected on camera. We had no reason to suspect that anything happened in the port. I have no reason to believe that anybody in the British Town port was tampering with people's cargo. None. I have no reason to believe it. However, we'd also implemented some changes at that time. We'd implemented a system where um, whereby the persons were not allowed into the port. One for COVID. So if you brought in a barrel, traditionally Barbadians could come to the port because of COVID. That was the first reason. And then the second reason was security. We take security very seriously. So we were not allowing people into the belly of the port. So that meant that persons had to hire other people to clear the cargo. Um, I'm not saying that's the reason. I'm definitely not saying that's the reason. But I'm saying there were these other factors at play. I think people had a, have a sense of comfort when they can see their cargo. Barbadians like to see their containers. They like to see their barrels. So then we made a determination as a government that we would allow people back into the port to come and see when the cargo is being, the containers, the barrel, the boxes are being opened so they could see for themselves what's in the barrel. They could see for themselves what's in the box. And since we've done that, I believe that we've heard less um, complaints. Um, I've also known of circumstances where per persons have identify the port as being the reason that their barrel or their container wasn't you know, filled to the brim as it normally is. And when we did our research several times, this is not a one-off, when we did our research, those containers were never even open in the barrel, in the port, sorry. Those containers were taken outside the port and open elsewhere at other facilities. So it could never have been the port. Um, again, I want to give Barbadians the comfort that if we found anything, we would address it. The staff in the Bridgetown port were also of the view that we should let people back in because their reputations were being tarnished, I think unjustifiably so. And so they've allowed and they're glad to have people come back in and examine their cargo. But if we were to find anything at any point in time, I give you the assurance and the public the assurance that we will do something to address it. I also give you the assurance that the port staff would want it so. They would want it no other way as well. So I am comfortable that we've done enough in relation to that. The last thing that we have to do when we're working with it now, the chairman and I just had a conversation, is that we have to create a cargo clearing facility where you come to collect your containers, you come to collect whatever your boxes, you come to collect your barrels. And instead of having to come inside the belly of the port, which exposes all the various elements and security risks, the inherent risks in security, you then would come to a facility that is not inside the belly of the port, but is also still under the control of the port, still very secure. Your barrel is there. You can come in. You can see your barrel. So that we address the issue of security. We do not expose the port. We do not expose, expose the government. But persons are then still able to have that view of their own items. Barbados provided safe harbor for several cruise vessels during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, with mm -hmm. many berthed along the West Coast, leading to some serious damage to the coral reef. Um, you indicated recently that compensation could be on the table from those cruise ships. Mm -hmm. So during the height of COVID, Barbados made a very big, very brave, very bold decision to be able to move people who were on these ships safely to the various places. Some were passengers, some were crew. I think people may have forgotten that at that time there were persons on board these vessels killing themselves at a rate that was higher than average, at a disproportionate rate. That the, the, the amount of mental deterioration was disproportionate as well. And just a general sense of loss. And that Barbados made a big decision to be able to help people to get home. We moved um, over 21,000 people. I've met Barbadians who were working on ships. In my constituency, for example, I've met two people. And they tell, they tell me that there were other colleagues from other countries envious of the position that Barbados took. So I don't want us to, to slight how big a deal it was and how brave a decision it was and how insanely proud I am that Barbados made the decisions that it made to be able to move people and to move people safely. And that during that time, we had no cases of COVID being reported as a result of that interaction. Very proud of that. There were about 40 something vessels that asked to be able to move um, or to be birthed here. We were only able to accommodate, I think, 28, um, give or take a, a vessel. 
we, vet, we birthed some on the West Coast and some along Carlisle Bay. Carlisle Bay has been a traditional anchorage point in Barbados for decades, for decades. So that we allowed people to birth where um, some big cargo vessels traditionally birth. So that any damage that we see in Carlisle Bay really and truly would have been damage that could have been done for years. Carlisle Bay has been a birthing spot for years. Um, along the West Coast, there were reports of damage, and this is in deep water, like 60 feet down. This is not the kind of coral that you would see if you go snorkeling or just an average diver. This is the real divers going down um, to see that level, of the damage that they saw, and that it was associated with the cruise vessels. We had a conversation with the cruise lines in relation to the damage that could potentially have been done when they were birthed um, in Barbados. Um, we've had meetings with CERMES because a lot of the, the conversation started when the CERMES report came out, but we had been talking before. And we've said very straight to the cruise lines, look, there's been instances of these reports. We, however, recognize that we put the cargo vessels there. We had conversation, the cruise vessels, sorry, there. We had conversations with Coastal Zone Management Unit. The coordinates were determined. We also worked with the Coast Guard to make sure that they kept where they were. For the most part, whenever we checked with the Coast Guard, the vessels was either in place or about to be in place because they were allowed to move and come back. I think what we could not have anticipated, um, and this is the damage that persons would have said were caused by the cruise lines, what we could not have anticipated at the time would have been the anchors doing, you know, back and forth, the level of damage that they allegedly did. Um, and, and because of that, we've been having that conversation with the cruise lines. But I also feel that it's important for, for us to state very clearly that because we've been working with the cruise lines as partners, you know, we've been building, I just discussed the potential conversations we're having, helping us build our cruise facility. We're talking to the cruise lines about allowing us to provision their vessels so that they'll be getting goods out of mm -hmm. Barbados, um, food stuff and so on. We're now finalizing CFARES legislation to allow us to put Barbadian, young Barbadian men and women on board these cruise vessels. So we have a very good working relationship. I think more importantly than trying to, to determine a dollar figure in terms of compensation is what have we done to make sure it doesn't happen again? Because I have a, a strong relationship now with the coral and to make sure that it is healthy. We've put in place a number of things. Any cruise vessel coming into Barbados now must let us know upfront cruise. If it's a mega yacht cruise, they must know up front. We're going to tell them the anchor points that they can use. There will be no anchoring of vessels along the West Coast. None. There will be no anchoring. Cruise have a dynamic position. Cruise vessels, a dynamic positioning system allows them to stay still without anchoring. We're going to ask them if they want to be on the West Coast to use that dynamic positioning. So if you see the vessel there, it doesn't mean that they've broken the law. It could be that they're using the dynamic positioning as well. On Carlisle Bay, even though it's been used for a long time, we're saying that only in exceptional circumstances will we allow cruise vessels to be in, in Carlisle Bay. And we've communicated this with the cruise vessels. We've communicated it with the cruise lines. They understand our position. And the port has been working with, it, with them to make sure that it doesn't happen. Where are we with regards to banning the importation and use of single-use petroleum-based plastics? Well, we did ban the importation and use of single-use petroleum plastics in 2019. We passed the legislation. The unfortunate thing is mm -hmm. that there's a lot, I know where you're going, Lisa. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of greenwashing where people say that their containers are biodegradable or where they say this item is environmentally friendly and they've been getting into the island. Yes. So we just had a meeting with customs I think they sent about 25 to 30 officers to look at how do you inspect, what are you looking for in relation to what we allow and what we don't allow in our legislation. We sent about four to six parcels that we randomly chose overseas to be tested. And each of those containers came, and plastic bags, came back as being not just having petroleum, but filled with petroleum. They're petroleum bags, but they've been greenwashed so that they have biodegradable, compostable, environmentally friendly. So they came in through the country. That's why we're meeting with customs, to be able to cut that out. Uh, we're going to have a meeting now with the manufacturers. We've already written and we are speaking to the persons with whom or to whom we, we, we felt the breach had occurred. We're speaking to them and saying, look, these containers were tested and they're petroleum based. And then we're going to have a larger conversation with the importers, the supermarkets and so on. The, the reality is, 
that the law allows us a $100,000 penalty for persons who continue to use petroleum-based products. I intend to enforce the law. And so my conversation is, please remove these items off your shelves now, or we will enforce the law. And to do so in a way that allows us conversation. I don't want, you know, it's not, it's not heavy handed. It has to be a conversation. I genuinely believe that in many cases, because the containers say biodegradable, because the containers say compostable, and because of the fact that greenwashing has become a thing, that a lot of people were misled. So we're going to work with them to get them off. The other thing is though that there are local people here making bags, plastic bags. Our local manufacturers have gone out of their way to use bio-based resins to make their bags. They cannot compete with these imported bags that are supposed to be bio-based that are not and pushing up, well, pushing their prices down and therefore making the, the manufacturers, the local manufacturers' prices seem higher. Mm -hmm. And they're the real deal. And I think the ministry has to work with the local manufacturers to be able to give them some kind of stamp or something that says this bag meets our standards. And yeah. hopefully as we, over the next week, because you're going to hear a lot about this over the next week, as we continue to build up our narrative around the bag. And we're not just banning for banning, you know. The fact is that these petroleum-based bags and products stay in the environment for thousands of years, sometimes forever. These are the things we found in the belly of the fish. These are the things we found around the nets of the fish and the turtles and so on. And these are the contaminants that would come back to haunt you and me. And that's the reason that we're implementing this restriction on these petroleum-based products. Minister, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much, Lisa, really for asking appreciate me. It. I really enjoyed the conversation. And perhaps we can come back another time and we could have... I'm sure there's a lot more to talk about. Yes, I believe so. Thank you so much. Thank that you. was the Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, the Honourable Kirk Humphrey, and I'm Lisa Lord. Good evening. <laughs>